Hi, today we are in Santa Clara in the Centrify office. Hi Tom, who are you and what do you do? Who am I? Yeah. Uh, I ask that myself all the time. So I'm the CEO of Centrify Corporation and uh, we're a enterprise security company and we're specifically focused on the top uh, attack vector that bad guys use to hack companies, which is uh, compromised credentials. So we're all about identity, users and their identity, and, and making sure people are, are safe uh, uh, in a business setting in terms of accessing applications. How do fraudsters compromise uh, credentials? Okay, that's a good question. So the bad guys, what they do is they either fish you with a PH, not an F, uh, right there by fooling you to go to a website to type a username and password, or they try to guess your password, um, also known as cracking your password. Um, and there's other ways that they go about stealing your password. And then once they get your username and password, they can access the applications you have access to. Or in a corporate setting, they can then VPN into the corporate network. And then they try to get additional usernames and passwords, including privileged accounts that have the keys to the kingdom. So that's how the bad guys, they start with regular end mm -hmm. users, and then they eventually get into privileged users like IT accounts and then they can like completely strip mine databases, servers with, with all the corporate information. It's a really big problem and that's what we're solving. Great. So is it possible if, if I would be a hacker to hack a computer, I don't know, basically a Facebook account or so, try whether, uh, or whether on the computer there's a corporate account, hack this, and then hack into the corporate network, become a uh, privileged user, and then hack the uh, full company? Oh, that that's happen happens all the time. In fact, if you look at all the data breaches that have made the headlines, um, Ashley Madison, not that we're uh, participating <laughs> in that, yeah. but you know the Office of Personnel Management, Anthem, you know a lot of these big corporations both here in the US as well as Europe, yeah what happens is, is oftentimes uh, users have the same passwords for their Facebook account that they have for their work account, right? And so if I can steal your Facebook account, there's a good chance that you're using the same password and then I can get into your work mm -hmm. account and then that's kind of like the, the initial opening or crack. And then they just kind of pour water, they freeze it, and the crack expands, expands by going out and stealing additional passwords um, you know, within the organization as well. So yeah, it just starts with a single password and then people getting into the corporate network and then stealing additional ones. Okay. Tom, what did you do before you started the company and basically how did you come up with the business idea? Yeah, I was very fortunate to work with a great team prior to Centrify. The, the uh, company was called NetIQ and uh, was one of the founders of that company. And that company also sold to enterprises. We, we did more infrastructure management like monitoring servers and applications, etc. And that was a great success. We went uh, public in July of 99. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was there for eight years and uh, had a, a lot of executive, uh, different executive positions there as well. And, uh, but after eight years, wanted to take some time off. This was a couple years after 9-11, so it was kind of tough going, just being a public company uh, in the early 2000s. So I took a little time off, which I highly recommend. It's always good to recharge the batteries right there. And then I hooked up with a venture capital firm to be an entrepreneur in residence. Mm -hmm. This, a uh, VC firm is called Mayfield, uh, one of the top uh, venture uh, firms in here in Silicon Valley. And I just had some ideas. And one of the ideas that I had was, was that, that as the world from an IT perspective becomes more heterogeneous in terms of different types of systems and applications from different vendors. So the world was moving away from kind of the monolithic, like Microsoft-centric environment. Uh, 10, 11 years ago was about Linux, and now we have SaaS, we have mobile, so it's a very diverse set of vendors. In that environment, that introduces complexity, and so each system, each application, you're, you're forced as a user to have a, a new username and password. In IT, it's very difficult for them to control who can access what. So the idea was, can we make a heterogeneous environment look and feel and smell like it's homogenous, from an authentication, i.e. login perspective, from an authorization, from an auditing perspective. So that was the genesis of the idea. And I got that idea just from what I had done previously and just kind of my observations of what was happening in the market at the time. Mm -hmm. Tom, give us some insights on how is such an EIR pr program running? You know, it's interesting that uh, entrepreneur in residence, 
um, are very popular here in Silicon Valley. And, and so typically, this is an opportunity for the VCs to bring some executives or people with good ideas and just kind of have them hang out at the, the firm and uh, be able to kind of think through their ideas, um, you know, interview people, just take time. So there isn't a pressure for the individual, like you have to immediately start a company. It's more an opportunity for uh, an entre a would-be entrepreneur just to kind of uh, germinate some ideas. And again, that kind of goes back to the value of taking some time off, you know, getting uh, some you know, fresh set of perspectives as well. And so you know, pr probably a good chunk of the EIRs, entrepreneurs and residents, actually don't go form companies. They may join an existing company or they may have an idea, they may pursue for a couple months, and in the end, after they talk to some of the investors, et cetera, they throw it away and they go on to a new one. Um, so the good news is, is that the VCs, the venture capitalists, do provide an opportunity for entrepreneur residents to have an office, have access to smart people, uh, et cetera. There is one drawback, that if you do have an idea and you form a company, mm -hmm. And that venture capitalist that brought you on as an entrepreneur in residence does not fund you, mm -hmm. then people, then other VCs will say, well, there must be something wrong as right. well. So, uh, you know, an entrepreneur residence can be a great time, but it does have some risk that if you're not able to get funding from the from the VC firm that that sponsored you, yeah. then it may look very negative on you and your idea as well. So it, there's both pros and cons. But the key thing to be an EIR is you have to have a prior relationship or be well respected by the firm to bring you on board. Tom, what was the process? So once you've identified this kind of idea, yeah. what did you do? Did you build the product or did you raise the money first? Yeah, you know, typically what you do is, you know, you just put the idea in a PowerPoint, right? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes people say, oh, you gotta write a big business plan and you gotta write, you know, a 50 page document and all that stuff. and. You know, typically it's just more if you can kind of consolidate it or condense it into 10 to 15 slides. Um, in a lot of cases, you know, especially if you're a known commodity, which I was having had a successful uh, previous startup that was able to go public, that can be enough to get funding um, there. But in other cases, if you're not, if you're an entrepreneur that may not have a prior track record of starting companies and, and making investors money, then, then it's probably more important for you to go out there and build the product and build the technology, get some initial customer adoption, or at least have a proof of concept as well. At the time, I didn't have to do that, mm -hmm. right? And that was good enough for me to go out at the time, this is you know 10 years ago, to raise money. And then the biggest challenge then was, was to build a team, because it was myself with the idea. I was very fortunate to uh, hook up with two additional of my co-founders, mm -hmm. Paul and Adam, and then once we got the money, then it's all about the team. You know, so first it's the idea, right? And it's the market and, and, and be able to get funding. Then from there, it's building the team and seeing if you can execute. And did you find your co-founders uh, via the venture capital firm or did you know them before? No, it was interesting that I had actually, Adam, uh, I had actually just met a few times from my prior venture, NetIQ. Um, and actually at one point he was trying to uh, sell the company he was with to, to us. So I got to know him, um, but not really that well. And then it was, you know, as an entrepreneur in residence, you go to a lot of conferences, you meet a lot of people. So it's a lot about networking yeah. just to kind of get ideas, hear what. And I bumped into him uh, and I hadn't seen Adam in a, in a year or two. Um, and uh, we just went out to lunch, and he said, "What are you doing?" I said, "What are you know what 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 are you doing?" Uh, and then I told him, I said, "I had this idea," and he was like, "Boy, that's a great idea. I would love to be part of that idea," uh, which was great. And then it turned out that Paul, who's our CTO, so Adam's our VP of Engineering, Paul had worked with Adam in Adam's prior startup, and so that once I got Adam, I was able to get Paul. So even though it was my idea, right? Um, initial idea, kind of at a 20,000 foot view level, that we really needed Adam and Paul to come in and really flesh it out. Um, and so, again, I think it really emphasizes the point that it's so important to have a team around you, because not one individual can do everything. You need to have other people that can contribute. 
And then once you get the initial team, you're able to go out there uh, you know, and raise initial funding, then you gotta build the, the next set of people and that's also just as critical as well. So you gotta get the initial set, but then, then the first 10 or 15 people are really key to actually get it to a prototype stage and, and deliver a version one of your, your product. Tom, what made you think that you three are a great founding team? You know, I think we all had confidence in each other. Mm -hmm. I think the, the thing is, is that um, it's not until you actually deliver, then you kind of, and, and you get a customer adoption, then that's the validation whether or not you have a good team. So, you know, you know clearly here in Silicon Valley, you can hook up with people um, that may have done, had success in the past, although there's a lot of entrepreneurs uh, especially ones in college or just out of college that don't have a track record but are just super smart and have a great idea, etc. Uh, but it doesn't matter, at, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you are super experienced and there was three or four guys that have done this thing for, done some comparable things for 10 or 15 years, or you're three or four guys, um, you know, right out of college or in college right now, at the end of the day, the way that you get judged is the initial results. Uh, in terms of whether or not you have built a team and that there's customer adoption. So all, all the stuff up, up until getting customer adoption is kind of noise and, and there's a lot of people that have hype and woohoo, we've raised money and all that stuff, but are the dogs eating the dog food? Are, are you getting customer adoption? That is the most important thing uh, in the end that, that allows you to kind of then judge and say, hey, I, I, we do have a good team. How long did it take you to acquire the first customer? How did you convince him to buy you or try your product? Yeah, so it was interesting. So we formed the company in March uh, and then we had a initial uh, early beta in like February, March. So it took us about a year mm -hmm. um, with a small team to, to build the, uh, the technology. And then we decided to go public with this in terms of announcing what we had, uh, et cetera. And, and uh, through my uh, prior contacts and, and networking with people, we had a set of beta customers. But ironically, there was a company up in Canada that just read the article and just said, hey, I like what it does, let me just go ahead and buy it. And we were like, you know, is this a joke? Yeah. <laughs> you know, someone picked up the phone and said, yeah, I just want to buy your product. You're like, who is this? You know, is this- Do is you this, even is... know the price? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was like kind of out of the blue. But you know, oftentimes if you have a good idea, a good product, et cetera, that people will just say, yeah, actually that scratches an itch. And so I think one thing that you can, uh, an entrepreneur should know is that do they really solve, I mean, so first of all, you have to have a great idea and you have to hopefully have a large market, then it's about the team. Um, but fundamental thing is, is that, you know, especially if you sell into enterprises, do you, do you solve a real yeah. point of pain? You've probably heard that from other people. Are you a, uh, you know, do you, do you solve, you know, a serious disease or are you a Band-Aid, et cetera? And it turned out with, with that initial customer, it was like, boy, I really have this pain and so I'm willing to kind of try it out, I'm just gonna buy it. And then subsequently, uh, you know, in that spring, so about a year, year and a half, we started getting more and more customers, including the beta sites, and then started building a pipeline, started hiring a sales organization as well. Tom, how did you collaborate with those beta customers in order for really to find this product market fit? Yeah, that's a great question. It's that, uh, you know, you gotta find the right people, um, the, especially the ones that are willing to be patient, to experiment. You don't want to lean on them too much because then it's like, hey, you're the guys developing the product. I'm not the ones. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, you just got to have get them excited about selling the vision. Uh, maybe it, maybe they're experiencing the real pain point in, in their business, and so they're willing to collaborate with you. Um, and also, you know, maybe you know it's an opportunity for them to get exposed to a startup or to, to help out a company as well. Um, so they may feel you know, kind of a philanthropic, you know, bent to themselves as well, willing to help you out. But it's critical. I mean, it's, you really need to listen to these customers, you know, out of the gate and, um, and try to convert some of them into paying customers as well. Um, and so, you know, having a, a set of beta customers are, are really important. I think a lot of times, a lot of entrepreneurs, they kind of like go ahead and ship it and they don't realize that you need to have a period of time in which you're, 
um, you know, listening and having the product be tested. An another thing I find really interesting is, you know, I've been on boards of other companies that people will say, oh, our beta will be on August 1st and we'll ship it on August, you know, three weeks later. But that's not a real beta process because there's no way that a customer will get in, install the product on August 1st, give you the feedback, allow you to fix it, and then you can do the quality assurance as well. So especially with the version one, you need kind of maybe a three, at least a couple month you know, beta process so you can get the feedback, you can fix and you can iterate, et cetera. What was the most valuable feedback that you got from the better customers which you did not expect? The most valuable feedback that we got was not necessarily on the product side of things. It was how they saw the product, what, what pain points that it solved for them. And so I did have an expectation that I thought that our product would be used and to address certain points of pain. And then in talking with them, in our particular case, I didn't realize the extent that they were looking for our product to address uh, regulatory compliance issues. I just didn't think as much about that. I thought it was like, oh, they would want it for improved end user productivity, they would want to re use it to reduce cost, et cetera. And I was, it was really an education to say that, especially with larger organizations that are more well-regulated, that it turns out that the regulators or the auditors can really drive things. And, and so it turned out that in talking with them, they were saying, yeah, I appreciate all those, the way that you're positioning your product, But in reality, the reason why I want to buy it is to check off these boxes right here. And I was like, geez, I didn't really think about it when I was initially formulated. I kind of thought that was more of a tier two, tier three thing. So it was just the con And then, of course, a week later, I switched the PowerPoint. I switched the, the bullet points and put those on top for the next set of potential customers. Uh, so again, it's not only important to have early customers to help test the product and iterate and give you product feedback. But it's also very important for the early customers to validate your messaging, your positioning, uh, et cetera. Because you can have a great product, but if it doesn't resonate um, and it's not clearly grasped, then, uh, then you know, it, it can just languish on the shelf. Tom, let's talk about the business model of Century 5. Yeah. So what are the target customers in terms of uh, company size, industry, and what type of roles you are really targeting for pitching? Yeah, so we're an enterprise security company, and it turns out the, the enterprises with the, the largest budgets um, are more bigger companies that are well-regulated um, and that are the targets of, of hackers uh, out there. So the core of our market uh, is the Global 2000. Um, and so our go-to-market is a mix of direct sales, some system integrators, et cetera. But, but we're fortunate that we're in a space called identity management where the pain point is also with smaller and medium-sized organizations that they have their users drowning in a sea of passwords as they adopt SaaS applications as well. So it turns out that we can also appeal to small or medium-sized organizations. The problem is, is that you can't use the same model, sales model, to sell to large enterprises that you sell to small and medium. So we're very fortunate that our product is elastic enough that we can sell to almost all size organizations, but you need to have the right mix and balance of how you go about selling it, because otherwise, you know, why have an expensive outside sales guy you know, calling on a, a 50, 100, 200 person small business, et cetera. So for the larger organizations, as I mentioned earlier, we do have more of an enterprise centric, we work with some system integrators, et cetera. But for more of the small and medium, we rely more on inside sales, people that are not out in the field, that are not as well paid, they tend to be you know, based at your headquarters on the phone. Um, and we work with a lot of channel partners uh, as well. So. Another thing that you know a lot of startups need to figure out is, hey, you got the idea, you got the team, you got the product, you got the messaging, then what's the go to market? And you know, obviously with version one, you just want to get customers, but when you get to version two, you, by that time you really need to figure out what's the proper way of going to market with your product that eventually will be cost effective. Do you sell online? Do you sell through the channel? Do you sell through inside sales? Is it more of a big customer enterprise and you need 
you need uh, a lot of very expensive guys that are, are and gals that are making two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, etc. So you need to find the right balance to make it eventually uh, economical for you as a, as a company. And in our case, because our product can be sold to anyone and everyone, and from a business perspective, we have a hybrid model of both direct and indirect, both outside reps and inside reps. So normally, when you start a company, yeah, yeah. you want to get very often feedback so you can use this kind of feedback cycle to improve the product market fit and the sales, yes. sales approach and so on for, so forth. You said that basically you have two customer segments like the, the large caps and yeah. the SMEs for example yes. and the large caps are mainly served by um, integrators so which are basically third parties. So you, mm -hmm. then the question would be uh, did you start outright with the smaller companies to get the higher feedback cycle? Uh, and second question is, how do you get customer feedback via third parties who are then serving customers? Yeah, a little bit of clarification. So we do work a lot with large system integrators, but we still, even though we may fulfill through the channel or system integrators, we do have a direct, we have a salesperson involved. Okay. For the larger ones, they're, they're on the outside. For the smaller ones, they're on the inside. So even though the purchase may happen through a third party, you know, we still have some direct touch to help help motivate people as well. But that's, you know, that's that's a good thing is that, you know, again, you have to figure out what's the most efficient way of going to market. Mm -hmm. And if you leverage a channel, then you're right. You need to make sure that you don't lose the feedback loop, that you're not disaggregated from the actual customer as well. And so the cool thing is, is that with technology today, because most of technology is increasingly becoming cloud-based, that you can ask for, even though the product may be sold by someone else, you can actually get feedback directly inside the product itself, like you know, with feedback buttons or things of that nature as well. Um, so you can, so you can kind of make sure that your your ears to the ground, so to speak, and listening to the customers by putting things into the product to make sure that you actually have that. And and from our, you know, we always focused on trying to always make sure that we were on top of what customers were saying. And so that, that's a big focus of what we've always had as a company as well. And we've added things to the product to give us the feedback loop, even in the cases when the product is uh, being sold or distributed by a third party. Yeah. Tom, uh, what have been the major obstacles over the last years that you needed to overcome and mm -hmm. how did you overcome them? Yeah, you know, the technology space is um, dramatically changing. And so when we first formed the company, we were more of an on-premises uh, software-based approach selling into the enterprise. But the adoption of cloud and mobile uh, is dramatic. And uh, like four or five years ago, we made a big decision to go whole hog into the cloud, right? And so I think that was a, a big obstacle for us, uh, which was, you know, how do we build our company, our technology to be optimized for the cloud, um, but then at the same time that we had a good product and, and, and customer relationships, you know, with our on-premise. Um, so, you know, what we did is that we we were actually, four or five years ago, we were profitable, Etc. And but we knew that we had to go out and raise some additional money to address the cloud. Um, so we raised a, another round of financing to fund that, and we basically created a parallel development organization to work on the cloud uh, as well. So that was a very big challenge for us, which was that you know we could have you know, either just incrementally done some cloud stuff, ignore the cloud and still carved out a nice business, or decided to go whole hog and embrace the cloud and basically offer to the uh, customers the ability to not only use our software, but our, our cloud-based service. And so when you move to the cloud, then um, the cloud, you know, is mainly, products through the cloud are mainly uh, bought through a subscription, for example. Um, and so you have to like reset the sales organization in terms of you know what their expectations should be for deal sizes, right? Um, also, a lot of the adoption of cloud products uh, first start with small and medium-sized enterprises as well. So that may emphasize um, having more of an inside sales team as well. So the second that you kind of jump on a paradigm shift, 
then it's just not about the technology, it's about your go-to-market, how you compensate people, et cetera. I think we've done a good job of migrating and moving to the cloud. Um, and you know, recent uh, competitive reviews in like Network World said, hey, Centrify is the number one uh, for SaaS single sign-on, for example. So I think you know, we can clearly point to the fact that we have industry-leading products and technologies and that we've successfully gone through that transition. Uh, but, you know, it wasn't easy and, and uh, you know, we had to, you know, really evolve uh, a, as technology. And, and the, the thing is, I've been doing this in the technology. I, when I first moved out to California, right out of college, I started at Oracle. Mm -hmm. And it just the pace of evolution, mm -hmm. it's it just amazing. I mean, it, it, there was just a way, you know, for like the first 15, 20 years, a way of building companies, building products, marketing them, et cetera. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was very, it was kind of the same. And then just over the last five, six years, it's just completely different um, in terms of how people go about building products and obviously having technology like Amazon can really facilitate yeah. things. The amount of money that some companies are raising is just like, oh my God, they're raising hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. This is like insane. When 10, 15 years ago, like people would raise five, $10 million, right? Yeah. Um, the way that you market to people is completely changed as well. So I think everyone's going through a challenge in, in the technology industry in terms of just trying to keep up with the, the rapid adoption. Tom, what made you go to the cloud anyway? Was it more of a vision that you thought, okay, long-term customers will want to have this? Or that you got some customer feedback which said, hey, you guys are only on-premise, don't you offer something on the cloud? Or was it more another thought? You know, like five, six years ago when, when we made that decision, actually most of our customers were not saying that, but we wanted to go to where the the puck would, would be, you know, yeah. there's a saying, you know, you know, uh, skate to where the puck's going to be right. as opposed to what's right now. And so we made that decision to do that. Um, and uh, we're glad we did it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's definitely a different model from on-premise. So, so today we sell both software and we, we sell both cloud services. The, the one thing that works to our advantage, which is, is that the software and the cloud capabilities, they don't overlap. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, a lot of companies, when they're, they start off as a software company and they move to the cloud, they're basically re-implementing the same technology in the cloud and so now they're in a situation where their salespeople say, well, I used to make more money selling this stuff, but now I'm going to make less money or this product's not yet fully functional or whatever. The cool thing is, is that when we w went out and built identity services in the cloud, it was completely complementary to what we, current we did provide and currently provide from an on-premises perspective. So the cloud products were net additive to, to what we were doing as well. But it was clearly at the time it was like, look, we felt at the time that, that more and more of people's infrastructure would move to the cloud. But the key philosophy we have, which, is, which differentiates ourselves from a lot of startups, that a lot of startups are saying is that, well, the world's going to be 100% cloud. Mm -hmm. And that's not going to be the case. Mm -hmm. If you sell to enterprises, that, that the, even in five, 10 years, it's still going to be a hybrid, that they're still going to have some on-premise systems, mm -hmm. they're going to have some cloud systems. And so from our perspective, if you want to provide a comprehensive security solution, you need to address both data center, cloud, and mobile as well with an integrated solution. That's what we're trying to do. Great. Tom, uh, you've started several companies. Um, what kind of big learnings did you generate over the years which can have uh, people interested in starting a company? Well, I think the key thing is is that, you know, definitely pick, you know, large markets to go after because if you don't success if you don't 100% execute, then you still have enough room to to be successful as well. Um, I think oftentimes people are like get obsessed with a with an idea and it turns out that, well, you know, it turns out the market's not that big. Now, if you want to start a business from a lifestyle perspective, like if you want to open up a restaurant you know, that serves a certain type of food, and then, yeah, maybe you can make a nice living just with that one restaurant. But if your goal is to, um, you know, create a, uh, like a technology business that you can sell product and technology throughout the world, 
it's preferable to uh, build something that you think that could have a large total addressable market. Um, the second thing is is that the importance of the team, getting really good people. It just that's one thing I've learned that 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 sometimes you know throughout my career that when you make bad hiring decisions, it may take you six months to you realize like this person is not the right person. Then it may take another three to six months to get this person out, and you've kind of lost a year as well. So one thing I always say is don't cut corners when it comes to hiring. Mm -hmm. That is so critical. Um, and get people that have, uh, also from a hiring perspective, get people that are in sync with you from a cultural perspective as well, that you can communicate very clearly as opposed to potentially having like a third party kind of act as a mediator as well. You know, at the end of the day, you don't necessarily have to have beers with your, your coworkers. Um, you know, because other people may have lives or have other things, but you want to be in a situation when you are in a room with those people that you, you need to feel comfortable, you need to respect them in terms of the, respect them not only as individuals, but also respect their intellect as well. Um, and you don't want to be sitting thinking to yourself, oh boy, that person's a bozo. Like, you know, you, you, you want to know bozo zone, right? Uh, bozo is a clown. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, okay, yeah. all right. Never, never know. Uh, but uh, yeah, you want people that you respect. Um, and uh, so it's, it's about the market, it's about the team. Um, and then just, you know, just the passion and desire just to like go out there and execute, knock down some walls, uh, et cetera. So those are, those are important things. But again, the key lessons I've learned throughout the years is being a good market. Uh, and sometimes you don't know it's a good market, but, but just you may, but you have to have that, that, that fundamental gut feel that you do. And then it's, especially in the early days, it's, you got to get a good team. Thank you so much for your time. Oh, Tom. thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank All you right. for sharing your knowledge. All right. Thank you. So if you have a business and you think you might have a threat of being yeah, attacked by fraudsters, <laughs> then check out Strentify. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much.